we're on, are we? Yeah. Hi there. Uh, I'm Phil Eisler, and uh, we're here to talk about. Uh, what are we here to talk about? Uh, music. You, you, I think. Oh, God help us. <laughs> um, music. Let's go with music. Music. Right. Okay. Well, Phil, thank you so much for uh, for your time and inviting. Right. Your, your studio on, on Warner's lot. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. On on the lot. So. <laughs> um, so we've done a couple interviews together, mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, you know, maybe for people who, who don't know, maybe talk about starting off with your your kind of your, your path to music because you, it's interesting because you had you were you're you're born in uh, you're you're Czech born mm -hmm. but raised in Britain, right? Just done your research because <laughs> the I mean the name <laughs> doesn't match the accent. So. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean I moved to London when I was pretty young. Yeah, I moved to London when I was nine, eight or nine something well, so like that's, that. That's a bit older though. So I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. So not too so, young, you know. But um, what, so do you? What was the, your parents decide to relocate? Was that the? Well, you know, I'm that old that it was, that, uh, you know, it wasn't the Czech Republic. It was Czechoslovakia, Czechoslovakia which was yeah. a communist right. country. This is, you know, we moved in early '80s. Yeah. And uh, so you know, we we were actually trying to get out. Yeah. Um, wow. And uh, uh, we we managed to we managed to get out of the country, moved to London, um, you know, where my dad had a had a job, mm -hmm. and we just sort of you know built it up from not a lot. So when did when did music kind of come in the picture for you? Was it at a very young age? In the, that that young? Yeah, age you know, I always remember music being around in in my in my house where I was right. growing up. You know, in in our apartment in Prague when I was when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Um, we had my grandmother, who um, is a classical musician. Mm. Um, she's still with us. She's a hundred. She's turning a hundred wow. next month. Good genes in your and uh, yeah, <laughs> um, she is a violinist, and she's actually been a music therapist for the last thirty odd years. Wow! So she and uh, she had maybe longer than 30 years because I think she'd already started doing it when I was a uh, when I was a little kid so she would you know she would come and visit us and, the, and you know she had a, a room in our apartment with the uh, with her old Beckstein grand mm -hmm. sitting there and she was sort of the, the I, I guess more the classical side of my my upbringing she um, you know I mean her music teacher in in primary school was Gustav Holst um what? and wow. and then uh you know, she went on to play professionally wow. and played with all sorts of all sorts of you know the the great conductors and that's amazing and uh you know recorded some of the earliest sessions at abbey road right. um and so so i guess you know growing up with her was was part of my music edu education and then sort of the, the other side of it was uh my my dad who was sort of fairly he was not a musician but fairly musical right and i remember him picking me up from school one day with a with an acoustic guitar from a department store and a sort of a carrier bag thing <laughs> and you know i think he just got it so that he could he wanted to play right you know bob dylan songs or whatever <laughs> um and you know he introduced me to beatles dylan you know stones crosby stills right. that kind of stuff um, as well as as well as some classical music, both my parents were were listening to sort of a mixture of that kind of stuff, and I started going to music school and singing in a singing in a choir and taking piano lessons when I was very very young. <laughs> Typical choir boy, you know. Well, I, me. I, 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 talk, um, I know Harry Gerks and Williams did that. David Buckley did that. There was a few choir boy uh, composers out there. Yeah, so. they might have kept it up a little bit longer than me, <laughs> but but um, but then we moved to to England and. I forgot about wanting to be a choir boy pretty quickly. I, right. I, I uh, well, I don't know that I ever wanted to be a choir boy, but, <laughs> but um, you know, I started playing in bands when I was really, really, really young. Um, from I think I was getting bands together before I could really get a band together. So I was, you know, maybe, maybe sort of nine or ten years old when I was, yeah. you know, when this this thing hit me that I wanted to be a musician, and I and I I sort of decided really around that age that that's what I was gonna do and um, that sounds incredibly precocious for a nine or ten right. year old kid but actually it's kind of a blessing and it, you know and I've I've talked to lots of people who do this for a living or who were I don't know actors or painters or right. whatever but they, they all sort of had that one thing in common that they sort of knew 
when they were very very young that okay this is this is what I'm doing and uh, that's a I think that's a huge blessing because if if you sort of don't have that thing that gets you out of bed every morning no matter yeah. whether you're making money not making money whatever um, I well I just don't know any other way of living myself right. so it, it you know so I always like when I met those you know kids in college when I was in, in college they'd be like what's your major oh I don't know I haven't picked one yet it's like how do you not know what you you know at that point I knew I, I was saying nine ten years old when I fell in love with film I'm not a musician but right. I, you know I fell in love with film and filmmaking and I knew I wanted to go to film school like pretty early on yeah, I mean, I think it's. I think partly it's being honest with yourself about right. what you really want, as opposed to what, what people expect of you. Right. So I, I'm sure you know. For a little while, I remember telling my parents that I wanted to be, you know, an airline pilot or a, <laughs> or something, you know, to totally out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, or you know, you know, do what my dad does or right. whatever. Yeah. Um, but I, I knew really, really, really early on, and that's you know, it's it's what's gotten me out of bed every morning yeah. from that age until now you know well, you know you, you found music at an early age you started playing in bands and um and when you got into film composing uh, mm -hmm. what was that switch that triggered like okay i like this now or th or this is what i uh, this is speaking to me did it call to you or did you search it out did you happen upon it or i think there's a mix of things like you know most things in life but i, I funnily enough when i was at school I did, uh, my school had an A-level in film studies, right. right? which I don't know what job they were expecting you to get with that qualification, absolutely <laughs> nothing apparently, but yeah. it was about the only thing I passed with flying colours, and uh, well that in history I did alright at, uh -huh. and um, I, you know, so I, I always had that love of film. And and there back then I sort of wanted to be in bands, you know. Right. But I always sort of used to think of, and I've always thought about music in terms of um, something visual for some reason. I don't know why, but I mean it, it is. It's a visual for me. It sparks visuals like that's Well, it always ma always made me think of something. Listening right. to you know a favorite album or whatever. Yeah. And uh, it just sort of logically made sense. I, I always thought it was something I'd want to do at some point. You know, I think I just thought, right, well, I'll be John Lennon first, and then I'll... <laughs> so, anyway, skipping the John Lennon bit, which obviously that didn't work out very well, and went straight to scoring films, so right. fine. <laughs> well, you're doing good, so <laughs> I think you're doing uh, quite well. And when you started out, though, mm -hmm. I want to I talk about it, because you, you had a kind of a, a stage name, Eisler. Mm -hmm. and recently well, it was, an, it was a nickname that I had from when I was... Back when I was in bands. Oh, really? Yeah. Because it was just basically... A people couldn't spell it, hence yeah. the silly spelling. And B, it's like it's like that very English schoolboy <laughs> thing of nobody like you know acknowledges your first name at all. Isla. <laughs> so that's what it. That's you know. And so you, you but uh, that's what you're credited as on uh, on the first started. few film things I did. Yeah. yeah so sure. why did you decide to? to I just got sick credit. of carrying it around. You know, it's like I do have a first name. Right. <laughs> So I figured I could have it back at some point. Yeah. And and uh, all of the things, it was actually a great relief not to uh, be trying to be a, a singer or whatever, because it was always a crap singer anyway. It was just, you know, it's always got shoved into the front. Yeah. So it proves that having the biggest mouth doesn't necessarily mean you're the best singer. And maybe a good front man, but not necessarily the best singer. Right. And... Um, you know, at a certain point when I started scoring films and, and really fell in love with that and, and thought, actually, I'm really happy doing this. This is great. Yeah. Um, it's great because then you don't do all of the, the shit that your, you know, Hollywood right. agents are pushing you into, like lying about your age and, <laughs> and having a silly nickname. So so at a, a certain point, it was nice to just, you know, relax and go, I, I think I've earned my first name back now, you know. <laughs> That's very cool. Um so you 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 do you're you're, you're well known for your TV work and mm -hmm. as well as your film work and you're definitely kind of being more prominent in, in, in films these days. Um, and we've talked in the differences about the, you know the differences between TV and film, but just uh, overall with the two different approaches, is there one that you kind of per, wait, what are the likes and dislikes of the two kind of for, from your point of view in terms of your approach and your style? Um. Do you know what? I, I, honestly, I think a lot of it is just to do with the people you're working with. Yeah. Oh, yeah so, 
you know, either can be a good or a bad experience. Right. Uh, and uh, I think ultimately you sort of try and build up relationships with the, the people that you see eye to eye with mm -hmm. crea creatively. And then, then you could do anything together. You could do, you know, do a cartoon together. You can yeah. do an action movie together. You can do a TV show, a movie, whatever. Right. Um, I mean, in terms of the sort of tangible differences are there's no time in TV. Right, that's what I hear. And there's something Schedules. good about that. There's something good about, you know, your first idea has to be your best idea, otherwise right. you're screwed, basically, and you have to get it done on time. And, you know, and just learning to be able to turn around changes fast and, and write music quickly. Right. Because I remember it being a terrible shock the first time I did a film. I did some indie movie where, you know, I had four months to do it. and. Uh -huh. And it was, I was taking my time. I remember thinking, oh my God, this is so hard, you know, not realizing that I was one day going to have to write that much music in a week. Yeah. And, and you, with you know, you're doing with a live orchestra too. Well, in some ways that makes it easier actually. Yeah, really? Okay. Because the, the, you know, orchestrating and, and, you know, writing a piece of music, first of all, you kind of, if it's just orchestra, right? Uh -huh. Well, you know what the palette is right away. Right. It's, it's not so much of a sort of trying to find what this mm. weird unique sound yeah. is and although i'd say most of my scores end up being orchestra and something else i've done a couple right. of things that were pure orchestra and actually they're really fun to do for that reason because yeah. you know i i sort of like restrictions in a way yeah. you're writing for this size orchestra this you know it's configured this particular way yeah. or you're writing for these weird synths or right. guitar or whatever I, I like that idea of finding the palette and because uh, if you have infinite possibilities you can end up with a little bit of a mishmash sometimes i kind of like the idea of you know so not having that sometimes track, yeah so you just had a recent film uh, how to be single mm -hmm. um and uh you've you've demonstrated you know your 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 kind of uh talents in comedy um, <laughs> um but I think considerable that, talents in comedy. But no, the and that's comedy, nothing to do with music. But I think, yeah, exactly. That's that's the I think the difficult part because comedy is, unless you're, if it does have music, I feel like it, the only way is appropriate is you know Looney Tunes where you're making mouse things. Otherwise, the comedy kind of. How, I mean, I feel like comedy, I find that's pretty rare. These, I mean, unless you literally are scoring. But exactly, that's why you I know feel like, an animated film, right, and but, even those, I mean, you know, are, are sort of so much what, more grown up these days in a lot of ways. And I, I mean, to be honest, a lot of the comedies that I've done have I've tended to be called upon as to score the the serious bit of it, right? And not necessarily, like he said, sort of Mickey Mouse the, the because comedy if, because if you, that if really you were, yeah, if you were to score the comedic. That's parts, a pretty would... broad approach to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to getting a laugh. And it, but then it's interesting because I I do have this conversation with comedy directors a lot when they say, um, well, how do we approach the comedy? You know, there are there are people that want no music right. uh, for comedic stuff and then people who want music but they really don't know what it should be because right. um, when you say comedy music you get those immediate associations yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> of whatever and and uh, yeah there's not not a whole lot of call for that I mean so with something how to, like how to be you know how to be single it's you're relying on the performances and the dialogue mostly. I mean, those are great. Well, and so, you know, in songs, a lot of times, I mean, That's they're true, they like say, "How be single?" All most of the comedy stuff was um, either not scored mm -hmm. and worked much better that way because you actually find it, it. You know, the performances, if they're good and the and it's right. well paced in the editing, which this movie really was. That you know, the music should make it worse. It's just going to step on all the lines and all the gags and right. and make it just make it terrible because a lot yeah, of the yeah. lot of the comedy in, in that movie was about awkwardness about the long so this you know one line another line and then silence uh <laughs> see that was awkward it's awkward so yeah. that you know but that's not funny if i'm sitting there going tick 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 tick, tick in the background right, you know it's right. it's like turned it into some kind of a montage thing and and in that film most of most of what i had to do was to find a theme for this main character alice and mm. and you know her stuff was actually her moments were sort of quite introspective and melancholy in some ways you know yeah. what was what might have been funny is setting up there would be a lot of moments where it went from sort of some introspective thing to a um to, to a gag or something yeah. and and invariably in that movie that was when the music would stop right you know 
There's a lot of that kind of thing. And I mean, I just think it's probably one of the most. I don't know. If from outside, it feels like it's a, a, a very challenging genre musically to. Approach. It is, man. I always say, <laughs> I'm, I'm. I think. Uh, you know, I always say, right, I don't want to do any more comedies because I keep getting called to do comedy stuff. Right. Because um, he's like, oh, if you do it good, then they're going to call, they're gonna call uh, you because well, I feel like it's a hard thing to do. That's subjective, I suppose. But, it, but, um, but I've been fortunate to, to do some good ones, you know, like Shameless. That's right. I think is, yeah, all the, I, I think, think of, thinking about it, most of the comedies I've done have been really dark. Yeah. You know, Shameless, Natural Selection. There wasn't a ton of, it, it, when there was, comedy and a lot of those things was like madcap raucous they wanted just balls out music not you know necessarily anything that was speaking to the action right. or whatever yeah. so so there was that and then then these incredibly dark moments which you know it just happens to speak to to my sense of humor but somebody like robbie pickering who directed natural selection uh -huh. you know this is unbelievably dark yeah sense of humor and that you know and they don't mind going there and i like that that's, that's cool. <laughs> You know, when you can find a director that you I mean, John Wells too. You know, who his ideas about what to do with Shameless, where he, t I think he took the English show and made it, you know, even darker in in some places. And some of his direction, when it might have seemed counterintuitive on the surface, was actually pretty genius. Yeah. Um, it's you a, know, it's a it's a great show. I mean, well, I, I remember there's a scene um, that I had to score where this where i think frank and his mo and his mother uh his mother comes out of jail you know of course and and she's horrible sort of you know just this manipulative sort of lifetime lifetime criminal yeah. and uh and there's this there's a scene where i think i can't remember if she's terminally ill or something or or there's but he's starting to have to take care of her and this this whole scene where he's bathing her mm -hmm. and um they had put in this temp that was very kind of wasn't on the nose but it definitely made it funny because it's already so awkward to look at right yeah and john saw it and went that's not awkward enough that's not what i want i want this i want you to score this almost like a love scene <laughs> i want this this gentle intimacy between them i want it to be so painfully awful to, yeah. <laughs> to look at and it is and it's you know and it's funny for it because just his reactions are you know that's amazing it's sort of very very subtle but yeah uh, i mean it's still a, a little bit off but chips you're doing the, the tv i mean right the tv adaptation film adaptation the, of chips. yeah well it's actually i mean it's early days um not you know we're still sort of right. finding what it is i think but it's it's really um from the music perspective again i'm not hitting tons of comedy beats yet it, it's yeah. it's much more uh, it's actually if anything right now it's much more of, a, of an action movie right and that's i mean i feel like that's a lot of the action comedies are kind of the, the go-to right now and they're very popular i mean chris leonard's is doing a great job with ride along and ride along right. too, and and really you know finding that uh that niche but um what and you know chips is a kind of an adaptation of a tv show and we are kind of in this age of reboots and remakes and a lot of people yeah. criticize it, but I always spin it as, um, I don't know what your take is on how the industry is kind of on that, but I, I love, I see it as like a natural evolution of storytelling, like retelling our, our, our favorite stories through different voices and different, and I like, you know, if you're sitting around the campfire and your, your, your uncle's it's an interesting way of looking at it, you're telling an old story like that. He's been, you sir down. should work at a studio. <laughs> um, I'm I think, <laughs> I, I think it's, um, no, that's a, that's a cool way of looking at it. Actually. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I, it all re it just, you know, it's, just, it's so down to who's doing it and, right. and what they're doing with it. it you know, there've been good and bad versions oh, yeah, of everything. Of been I mean, grab ones too, of course, but I um, do think there's a glut of sort of, which is nothing new in Hollywood or the record industry or right. any form of art that's ever been monetized in right. any way, right. you know, becomes repetitive because art isn't something you can really quantify. It's not, right. you, it, it's not. Like we're gonna set up a business and make music, you know. Yeah. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. It, it's it's Vegas more than anything else. It's yeah. sort of, you know, you sort of roll the dice on somebody's talent and them connecting with an audience, and that's as much of a sure shot as you can have. So I think when people do remakes and when people do a ton of these different things, I think 
you know, the franchise sort of stuff. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily. I just think there's a there's a world in which that and original ideas need to coexist. I just don't get it when people get offended. They're like, oh, you can't touch. The well, the I thing, mean, it's the, funny. The, the that, you know, going there's a few guys on my crew that that are that, that apparently are diehard Chips fans, really? which, you know, I had no idea. But uh, one of the guys I work with, you know, when he heard I was doing it, his first words weren't congratulations. His first words were, don't, don't fuck, fuck it up. up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't ruin my childhood. Like, right, I'll try. It's, it's people get so attached to it's. I mean, it's it's great because well, and there's a the there's a theme, of, you know, and there's a there's a so all of these things and a great theme, you know. Yeah. But it's it's at the end of the day when you do something like this and you do a remake, a reboot, whatever you want to call it, yeah. I have to approach the material for the material and not exactly. with any kind of baggage right <laughs> um and then you see what works you know maybe the original ideas work maybe yeah. they don't it's been you know things get reinterpreted so yeah, and so they should you know i mean who wants to rehash the same old thing you can always go back to exactly the original yeah well i'm excited to see what you yeah me, <laughs> me too <laughs> so you also um were in the headlines a little bit for um i mean for good for good reason you know talking a variety about your uh, work on the newtown document mm -hmm. documentary which is um uh, got amazing reception, and uh, you did an amazing re approach. You, you brought in a group of composers, and yeah. you kind of did this group thing, and everyone donated their time. And and well, what was that experience like? I mean, it's such an important film, and it's it's yeah. using music, the art of film, for such a great cause. You know, these days, are like, oh, you working in the ind entertainment industry? You know, what are you doing to help the world? You're not a doctor. <laughs> You're not a, you're not well, a, you it know, felt like, like an opportunity to, right. to do something, you know, hopefully useful. Right. Um, when I when I first spoke to the producer, who is a friend of mine uh, from years back, I had no idea she was making a film, actually. Really? Wow. Um, I, I called her because uh, the, the gun debate is something that I'm sort of very passionate about and yeah. um, didn't feel like I was able to do anything by ranting on Facebook which really is the Monday equivalent of yelling out of a window <laughs> yeah. and um, and so I called her and she said well funny you should mention that I'm I'm uh, making a film about Sandy Hook uh, you know, I sort of froze yeah. for a second and and it's funny because everybody has the same reaction when I told them that I worked on the film mm -hmm. it's such a um, Un and understandably so it's it's such a um polarizing issue and it's such a terrifying topic yeah people course. just don't even want to deal with it and i think that's sort of one of the reasons why i took it because i i knew that the public would have that reaction to a certain extent as well you know to watching it and and a comment that i used to hear a lot when we went to sundance with the film just a, a, a month or two ago whenever yeah, yeah. it was um was wow you know so so impressive but i'm, I'm scared to see the movie yeah. and so i sort of my you know my stock answer ended up being well you should be but see it anyway right um i think it's just a subject that doesn't get dealt with very much it's, it's not a movie about gun control it's a movie about grief it's a movie about the long-term results of the long-term implications of, of gun violence so you can take that from whatever political perspective you want mm -hmm. you know it's not um it's not an anti-gun advocacy movie and it's it's you know whether or not i believe in that or whether or not any of the other people involved in them in the movie believe in that including right. the the composers um wasn't relevant to the project it, it, it's it's more about sparking a debate um on a new level yeah. because this topic has people shouting from both sides of the aisle you know right. me included it's very hard not to yeah, not to um get very emotional about that debate whatever side of the argument you're on right. but what was great at sundance was i would see some of the best q and a's i've ever seen at sundance and they were much more like town halls in a way wow. because you would have you know we there was all this security at the screenings because of, of what the film was and so um you know at certain points we would get questions from cops and um, 
you know people that were local people that were from out of town so like a lot of different points of view and the over overriding feeling i got from the whole thing yeah. was um people wanting to know what what next and that's very heartening for me to see because if the film can do that then then it was worth doing wasn't it of course um I mean, you know it, it actually getting people to talk and maybe finding solutions right you know because real life isn't really played out on the fringes but you know yeah. that's that's the internet that's where everyone can shake their fists at you know no one in particular and yell right. a bit but it's you know real life kind of plays out in the middle a little bit yeah you know so it was it was good seeing that you know and from just the the perspective of working with all those composers so the idea was you kind of fostered an idea and it was a just shared was it beamed out at the same time and everyone huh. worked on it? Or was it, kind it was, of a, it was sort of a work in progress. And actually, it kind of still is because mm -hmm. there was so much music that it's it's proven to have a life beyond the film. Right. And we're now talking about an album, maybe some concerts, you know, a bunch of different things. Of um, the reason I first reached out to anybody, I can't remember who I called. I, I think I might have called Chris Lennertz or Blake Neely first. Right. Um... And it was really just about calling my mates and, and saying, hey, what do you think of this? And, and at that point, when the, you know, documentaries are always sort of a long time in the making. When, that, when it finally came together and they were ready to, to play me something, I was in the middle of two movies and, and a bunch of other stuff and, and things were crazy. And it was like, you know, three or four weeks until they were going to dub the film. Yeah. And I remember thinking, this is great, but how the, how the hell do I do it? Yeah. And, you know, so I thought, well, well, what about if I got somebody to do it with me? So I rang a couple of people and then the, the idea just started to snowball a little bit. Like, well, what about if I rang a lot of people? And what I realized was actually the, 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 um, it was completely unhelpful as to, as to, <laughs> as to saving time because it took more time oh, of to, or to, 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 to organize it all. all. Yeah, um, Jesus. but it turned out to be creatively a cool idea. The first thing I thought about was that the, the film, you know, the score had to be very humble. Of course. Um, given the subject matter and given yeah. the people that are in the film, um, it was an extremely delicate thing to handle. And I, I, I didn't think that my point of view alone yeah. should be on, sure. should be in the movie. Right. I just thought, you know, it, it, this is a film about community. And th then I sort of started to hatch this idea that maybe it should be a community. It should be made by a community, at least on the music side. Um, and, you know, so many people jumped on board the idea that I just thought, OK, well, this let's try this, you know, and there, there were, you know, there were definitely a couple of doubters who thought, OK, well, this could be a train wreck. But, I just, I, you know, I, I sort of thought, OK, if, th if this just completely slams into the wall, Worst case scenario, I could not sleep for a month and just do it all myself. But right. that's just, I just never thought that was going to happen, right. you know. Um, I think people were more con most concerned about continuity through the whole thing. So I, I kind of thought my job was as much a curator as a, right. as a composer. So I did write a couple of themes and I gave it to people, but everybody did something different. Some people wrote takes on the theme. Some people wrote something completely different. Some people right. wrote to picture. Some people wrote away from picture. There were a couple of people who just said, I, I can't watch this film but i'll donate music i'll you wow. know um and we got music from so many different amazing I know, composers that's and a great list. but what was the, the the really fun point for me i mean fun is the wrong the wrong word to use in the context Rewarding. of this film but yeah. but uh it, it, exciting creatively was when i basically we had a server built for everybody to start putting their ideas up and uh at a certain point i said <laughs> right in this email and i every step of the way i would kind of give people a way to back out in case anybody wasn't into this because it's you know music is an incredibly personal thing and then you throw politics into it or right. you know even though it wasn't political it's a sort the of a hot is. button issue and all of that yeah. so so i was always very careful to let people right. back out if they wanted to nobody did but you know i basically said all right, I'm going to put this out there, but what if, what if we just all dive into each other's folders on this server and steal? Wow. 
Uh, and, you know, I mean, if you really want to make this a collaborative score, let's sort of make this a, a kind of a collage that everybody has yeah. a part in. So the, that idea kind of snowballed a, a little bit, which was really amazing to see. And if you think about it, it's so 17 composers that are all normally competing for the same gigs too. Right, that's true. Um, and if you, because everybody donated their time and the royalties and everything else, and we're all working for free, well, you level the playing field and I mean yeah. so it's it was kind of it was actually a sort of a fairly liberating experience like that because people and people did some great stuff not all of it could make it into the movie because it just simply wasn't yeah. enough space for it but you know you had to put what's right in the film but that's why we're thinking about an album now because you know a there was so much music left over from the film that's really great you should yeah. see the light of day well, that'd be great. That'd be um, great you know, and people are still writing. It's just a subject that sort of continues to right. inspire all of us in one way or another. You know. the, the film Newtown is about that specific tragedy, but it does spark a, a gun debate thing. And I don't want to get into too much of it, but I mean, there is... you haven't got enough memory cards <laughs> to get me started <laughs> I mean, on. No, exactly. Started on that and I'm, subject. And I'm not on your side. I'm not. I, I'm, I'm on your side. I'm not here to, to argue against you. But I, I just want to get your thoughts because the topic does come up in in film a lot. Mm -hmm. of, of violence in film and the effect of that on society and I know I spoke with John Powell and he, he says I'm a pacifist and he opted to that's why he did only animated films he says I didn't want to contribute my voice to something that he didn't truly believe in better society so I'm just wondering what your views are on the effect of the entertainment industry and guns such a part of our entertainment culture not just our yeah. you know just wondering what your thoughts are on there I mean I don't know I think it's Again, it's an incredibly personal experience. Right, Look, yeah. I, I'm a big fan of, uh, of, of you know, yeah. action movies and and I like playing Call of Duty and yeah, all the rest too. of it. I would never have a firearm in my house in a fucking million years. Yeah. And, um, you know, and I'm thing, not, yeah. you know, I'm as left as they come in politics right. and, and I'm not, I'm not interested in fighting and blah 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 right, and yeah. you know uh, I wouldn't exactly call myself a sort of flat out hippie you know I don't know maybe I am who knows <laughs> but it, but I you know I'm not I, I'm definitely uh, not you know a sort of gun toting oh yeah I don't I, that, uh, I think whatever it's, it's, I but think the, those, I think yeah. the point I'm trying to make very ineloquently is that um, that I think there is a role there I think there's definitely a glorification of of guns, of violence, of, um, you know, it, it, to varying degrees it, of maybe cartoonish violence right. that is so extreme that it's ridiculous yeah. to, you know, things that are very realistic on, on screen. Right. And I, I really, I, I'm really not sure what the sum effect True. on society yeah. is yeah. because there are definitely cases of, you know, I mean, listen, Salinger supposedly inspired a whole generation of of uh, killers and would-be killers right. um, by giving a voice to alienated teenagers, right? Right. But what does that say about the, the people that actually, you know, like Hinckley or, you know, somebody like that, yeah. who actually went out and did, did those things, they were right. mentally ill to, to start with. They exactly. didn't do it because of a book. Right. Um, and to argue that, you know, glorifying violence or or whatever in movies or in books or in in, in TV mm -hmm. shows um, actually causes this stuff, I think is a completely ridiculous argument. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think uh, there are, and I don't know how you, you know, you police what's appropriate for who. There's there's no great way of doing that apart from you know what's appropriate for your children basically right, exactly, right. Um, yes I think there are movies that are mindlessly dumb and <laughs> and glorify dumb behavior but there are you know smart pe people around and there are dumb people around exactly um, it's down to the, the person uh, so you know put it this way I don't think censoring anything is is the answer is the answer because yeah. when you grab for sort of short term answers to things like that as we know from history they have long term implications right um, so I don't think uh, I don't think getting rid of those movies is a is a yeah you know, whether it's a good or a bad idea I don't think it's a useful yeah, idea um, if 
like John, you decide you don't want to be a part of that, more power to you. You know, right. I think I think that's absolutely fine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but again, that comes down to individual choice, doesn't it? Exactly. You know, we talked about comedy, we talked about tragedy, we talked about a lot of things, but kind of looking over, um, uh, kind of in, in your personal life, um, you know, your your father, your uh, husband. Um, when you became this, when you kind of built your family, when you kind of uh, did that change your perspective on 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 the way you write music? That you know. Oh before, God, yeah. Before it happened and afterwards, I mean, did, did that really kind of a shift on your, I guess. I don't. Well, it's. Uh, I mean. The way you approach. Weapons. I don't know if you can say I started approaching music differently. I, you know, yeah. I don't think I did that, but I, I think, um, you know, anybody who sort of knows love somehow and then yeah. has kids and. You know, that's a whole other level. Um, I think it affects you emotionally and emotions affect your music. Mm -hmm. So, you know, music is emotion in, yeah. in the most direct way, I think. Right. Um, so, so yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it definitely changed things. I can't, there are things, you know, which is why, I mean, <laughs> Newtown was brutal because oh, it, it, it's, you know, and I, I'm certainly not, do, doing any kind of woe is me number here because you know um uh it's you know obviously there are the people that lived with these kind of tragedies and then the people that you know on another level were involved in making the movie right. were very close to those families for a long time and you know those things become personal and it's a you know and, it, and that's tough yeah um but even watching that kind of stuff which is you know why I completely understand when there were some composers who said I can't watch that. Yeah. My first reaction was I didn't want to watch the movie, let alone do the movie. Yeah. I just decided I sort of had to ultimately, right. and that came from a conversation with my wife actually. Um, you know that I, that that was something I wanted my kids to grow up knowing. Of course, yeah. Um, funnily enough, you know the uh, the editor on the movie. Uh, I found out later I had the exact same conversation with his his dad. Really, wow! Because when he was asked to do it, he said, "I I can't." You know, he, he's got two very young kids. Mm. Can't handle it. And his dad said the same thing: "You got to got to do it for your kids." You know. It's true. Yeah. Um, so uh, it makes it very hard to to do that. But on a much lower level, yeah. I can't watch anything. If I mean anything with kids being her even even spoken down to or whatever of the the, the i'm just sort of the, the the opposite of the you yeah. know the the public schoolboy hardcore englishman who's you know good god we don't talk to our children until they're 13 like give them the nanny you know i'm the opposite of that i can't i you know i can't say anything but sort of kids being belittled or bullied right. or anything i just can't watch that shit anymore and yeah. and i've got a far weaker stomach for violence you know talking about tv violence and movie violence yeah, there's much less See, that I can. The, the, the dad brain took over. The dad brain took over. <laughs> the funny thing is, years before I had kids, years, years, years ago, maybe you know, over a decade ago, I, I remember scoring a movie where a dog got killed, oh, and literally go, I think I'm gonna have to turn this movie down. I can't, <laughs> can't take it. This shoots a Labrador. It's all over for me. I can't I think handle it. There's a website called Does the Dog Die, and it's like a, a list of films, list that for people who don't want to watch movies. Isn't there a movie? Like with animals getting hurt. <laughs> no, it wasn't a movie. Wasn't it on like Entourage or something where a dog gets killed and everybody like the screening's going great until I, the dog they, gets killed and then everyone's so like, "Oh fuck this!" <laughs> out of the yeah. <laughs> out of the screening room. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I agree with them. So just looking at the the um, industry uh, uh, in general, kind of the state, not just the music industry, but maybe just the film industry. Mm -hmm. um, what's something that's going on right now that is really good that you see and you go? This is awesome. We need to keep this up and push it forward in the momentum. In the industry, or as, as in, in terms the, of the the, the art. Oh, either the art, I guess, or even the business. Side I mean, of I think that the the art is what keeps it constant. You know, I think there's, I mean, it's so many talented people in this in this town, and right. and I think it's funny how LA has this sort of reputation for somehow being a vacuous place. Yeah, <laughs> which I find sort of you know a fairly vacuous comment because you know it, okay it's a relatively young town and doesn't doesn't have the history of Prague or Vienna or Paris or whatever but right. but you know so many talented people gather 
here to to you know work on music or movies or whatever um I, i've met so many talented people here and I, you know i just uh, i read so many great scripts and so there's I, I think there's a lot of good stuff being made i think um in terms of the business what's really heartening to me is that i'm seeing the sort of middle ground mid-budget movie coming back right. so f the sort of like 10 to 50 million dollar movie seems to be enjoying a bit of a resurgence it, has, it became a very giant tentpole studio thing for a while they died out man they yeah. there was you know there was a point where i first got into the film industry where I, it seems whenever i get into any anything i come at just the wrong time people are like ah you missed the boat mate you should have been here 10 years ago fuck off you know and and when i started scoring films i was doing you know like one million dollar indies and uh you know short films and whatever i could get my hands on um and those sort of movies like especially at studio level just didn't exist yeah so indies like that couldn't get financed for 10 million dollars or so that just wasn't happening uh and studios weren't making those films anymore right. they, they all of the sort of you know the warner independent the, those kind of places shut down and they started to come back because because i i do think that you know we saw a sort of period where studios were gambling everything on on these massive tempo yeah. films and you know three of those fail in a row and the studio's out of business and a lot of people lose their jobs over yep. it. yeah it's so you know basically i think that middle ground of you know that that sort of budget range is such a fertile ground for not just for new talent but for, for being able to take some risks absolutely because what the hell is this without being able to take some risks you know and i see um, that a lot in the uh it's not my particular favorite genre but the horror genre has has been amazing because they do these low budget for one two million and they see the returns and the studios go okay we can well yes but it's funny like anything else we were talking about not being able to quantify any kind of art right very easily yeah until it becomes a production line and then it's really no longer art then it's then yeah. it's we're going to do the 15th sequel of this yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> and i think the same thing happened with the sort of the um what was the movie paranormal activity yeah, right the, like the, five, six, seven, yeah so those kind of things you know we, yes genius idea totally right. um but then of course you know we're going to get paranormal activity five six seven eight nine da, 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 or whatever right. you know and i'm being unfair to i don't know yeah. I don't know what sequel they're on, <laughs> but but uh, but you know, like anything where there's money to be made, you know, obviously, and probably rightly, you know, they they try and make money there. That's, you know, why not? Uh, but I just think, I actually think, in in a slightly higher price range is where a lot of cool stuff is happening because it's it's very difficult to make a movie for a million dollars surprisingly difficult it sounds like a lot of money but you know i know a lot of people who have and you're always struggling at the end when you get to post you know how do we pay for the mix how do we pay for music how do we pay for you know for anything right. it's very difficult to you know making a movie no matter how you do it is involves a big team Absolutely. and yeah. you know that's why those budgets exist right um but you know i think sort of in that world of 10 to 50 million dollar movies there's some really interesting stuff being made both at the studios and, and away from the studio and i think you know kudos to the studios for, for making those kinds of films and taking some risks and every now and again even we you know i don't think deadpool cost that much no that was make, the did thing it? that was a uh, and it i mean and it's original it's a right. you know it's it's a i saw it last night actually it's you know it's yeah it's yeah, it's, a, it's, it's genuinely a good right. movie that you know took more risks than than you know <laughs> i'm sure if that movie had cost 200 million dollars yeah. it would have been very different oh, of course yeah and but it's then again you're talking about and now we got the batman versus superman they said the r-rated cuts coming and then they're saying oh the next wolverine movie we're gonna make it r because oh it's r movies it will make money but you know <laughs> then it goes <laughs> yeah uh, it, i don't think that's why i'm uh, that's why you know i mean i have no problem with the studio machinery or the or any kind of business machinery yeah. that perpetuates you know the sale of art in right. some way whether it's yeah. movies or music or whatever because it's as as artists that's how we survive exactly and sometimes that machinery is you know like you saw with the old record industry yeah. is fucked up or with the current record industry if that's if there is one <laughs> is even more <laughs> fucked up but that but that is ultimately how we make a living i mean Absolutely, you know yeah. Which is why sort of this whole debate about intellectual property is so important because yeah. 
um, no matter how much you think musicians live in castles and you know have billions of limos, the realize is the 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 real um, reality truth of yeah. the whole thing. Reality, thank you. Reality. That's the <laughs> the real truth of the not lies of the thing of the thing <laughs> is that um, you know most people uh, struggle to make a living out of it now. Um, so you know, I certainly consider myself very lucky to be able to do that. Kind of covered maybe some of the negative aspects a little bit, but what, what do you think is something that is not so good that's happening that should change, whether it's an in industry or art or whatever? Is there something that you see that like I wish it was more in this direction, or we should change it towards this direction? Or huh? I don't know, man. I just live in the positive all the time, you know. <laughs> all right, you're sorry, I don't. <laughs> have a clue um i don't really know i uh, honestly i you know not to sound all everything's great yeah. um there are definitely things that that are uh not so great about the business but there always have been and i don't like to bitch right it's okay. just yeah, you know fair. look i'm i'm very happy to be making a living it's and to be doing something i love doing right. and and honestly the music business has always been kind of a dark and seedy place, and so is the movie business. Yeah. So let's not kid ourselves too much. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I'm not advocating any of this stuff <laughs> too much. But also, you know, it wouldn't be interesting without that. It wouldn't be interesting yeah. without all of those. So it's like now we look back yeah. at the studio system as this sort of golden era of like oh, all these dark secrets and, it, um, you know, didn't people used to live in black and white then and everybody looked fabulous? You know, I'm sure it was pretty fucking dark back in the day, you know. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, I think it's a very tricky subject when you try and um, completely homogenize the business and sort of make it fair and, you know, because yeah. it inherently isn't. Um, on every level and there are some things that I, I think it's great that they're being tackled especially you know when you're talking about inequality sexism racism things that yeah, yeah. that are just it's we're in the fucking 21st century and right. it's just ridiculous Absolutely. that some of those standards still exist but in terms of sort of you know what gets made and what doesn't get made it's always a struggle and it's always going to be a struggle yeah. because someone's always going to hold the keys you know and what's interesting is that I think since the advent of the internet and certainly social media you know people have had far more opportunity to put out whatever they want and take whatever risks they want without having to be beholden to some of these sort of you know gatekeepers and I and I think that's great too and then you know and then people are discovered like that all yeah. of a sudden. I think it's great that people have a platform Absolutely. and I'm more of a voice. Absolutely. And uh, I guess to, to wrap things up uh, completely unrelated to music or anything, what does what does Phil Eisler do to for fun? What are your hobbies outside of work um, to recharge? I mean, I mean, you have your family and everything, but what are you? You're, you're assuming I do any of that for a start. <laughs> I talked to Jeff Rousseau and he's like, I, don't, I, I haven't been on a vacation in like two and a half years. Me neither. <laughs> So, I don't do shit, man. I live. This is it. This is it. <laughs> I did, I mean, I hate to say it, but that's kind of true. It's it's uh, it's funny because there are very good friends of mine who, you know, always have a habit of saying things like, "Careful what you wish for," and I go, <laughs> "Yeah," and then when you're there, you're like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> um, so I guess the the what I do for fun. I mean, I don't want to make it sound too miserable yeah yeah uh but the, the but the whole thing is finding balance you know trying to get because you it whether you like it or not this is a sort of 18 hours a day thing yeah. and that's not all about just work it's about people like me having a kind of obsessive personality because yeah. if you want to score films might make you uh not the best person around socially <laughs> but it's definitely what you need to be able to do a job like mine you know you have to be able to sit there and obsess over a piece of music and and what's it doing to picture and all that kind of crap yeah. so so that um i mean i i have to say um the fun for me is a lot of the fun is in the in the job i, I love doing this course, you know yeah. and um 
a lot of the fun for me is is collaborating with people so the, the collaboration with the directors and the producers I like but my favorite uh, my favorite moment of the whole bit is standing in, in front of the orchestra at the end and and making the music because I, I guess that's where I came from was you know was making records right it was that moment of making music that's why I got into it you know yeah. the sitting in the cave bit I could sort of do without to be honest but yeah. you know <laughs> music doesn't happen without that right well Phil thank you so much for your time oh, thank it's, you it's man been it's been so fun. enlightening and, and uh, such a great chat so cool really cheers you. man